As I mentioned at the beginning of our time together, tonight will be a time of encouragement and challenge. Tonight we gather to remember and to respond to the only event in history that solved the greatest problem in history. I want to say that once more. Tonight we gather to remember and to respond. Both are important. To the only event in history that solved the greatest problem in history. As a rule, unless people agree on what the problem is, they cannot agree on what the solution is. So what's the problem? G.K. Chesterton once recorded a letter that he had, he had responded to a newspaper article uh, in, in, in the local paper at the time, and there was an article that had posed the question, what's wrong with the world? To which G.K. Chesterton replied, what's wrong with the world, dear sir? I am. Sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. We are all, in different ways, asking this question, what's wrong with the world? Our emotions, as we respond to social media and news experiences throughout the week, validate that we have that question somewhere in our purview at all times. What is wrong with the world? The people who run it? Us? We have some very deep flaws that we are not normally very willing to be honest about, with ourselves and certainly not anyone else. There was an article, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've been reading newspaper lately, it's kind of fun to hold these things. Um, they, they weigh less than a phone and actually are uh, less expensive. Um, but there was an article and another opinion piece, and, and the title of the article is, A Problem Too Deep for Laws to Solve. And in the article, it mentions this quote. It says, somewhere along the line, the souls of people have become sickened. And I think as I was reading this, this brief opinion piece, one of the things that kind of dawned on me very quickly is, I don't know if we have any real data that supports that souls have ever been super healthy. <laughs> What's wrong with the world? This, this will help you. Perhaps this can raise some, some eyebrows for you. Have you ever had an argument with someone? And I'm talking about a really intense one. You know the kind. The kind where you walk away seething in anger with the other person. Now, here's, here's how I know, because I'm getting ready to see a reaction in a lot of your faces. This is the kind of argument that you have where you replay the argument and make up the then, therefore, things you would have said if you could have remembered them or thought of them fast enough. You know, because do you do this? Do you replay those argument moments? Some of you, after you're walking away, you know, after you're done chewing off your bottom lip, and, uh, and, and for some of you, your tongue, and then you have that moment where all those things that you would have said if you could have thought of them quickly enough, gosh, where were they? Let me ask you, as you're replaying those events, those arguments in your head, as some of you just hinted that you might do from time to time, tell me, when you replay those arguments in your head, who wins? Let me ask you another question. Is your first impulse to make sure that the truth wins? Or is your first impulse that you win? What's wrong with the world? I am. You are. Now today we live in an age where the one wrong thing to say is that somebody else is wrong. To say it's believed to say that anyone, to say, I'm sorry, to anyone, that there's anything at all wrong with them, if you were to approach anybody and suggest that something could be wrong with them, it is to attack their identity, who they are at the very core, and also to completely subvert everything they trust. You will become, and I mean one, the immediate moment you decide to tell somebody there's something wrong with them. And yet tonight, the entire reason we gather here is to have an honest moment with ourselves and I pray each other to completely recognize that we were not only wrong occasionally or every once in a while, 
but the word wrong doesn't even cover who we are or how far away from right we really stand. Good Friday is the event marked in history that confronts the true identity of who we are, isn't it? And it also, though, tonight, I hope you will see that it also provides the possibility of what can be. Isn't that what we're dreaming for all along anyway? The past two weeks, Pastor Rashad has helped us by taking a look at Jesus's, quote, in-transit experiences as he labored toward the cross. John 16 was broken into two weeks of study to have a, a serious conversation about what God it is we are following all the way to this cross. Now, in that study, one of the things we've come to now tonight is John 17. And in John 17, we will look in just a few verses tonight from Jesus' last night with his disciples before he's arrested and taken away to be tried and to be killed. What we'll read tonight from John at this time is less than 24 hours from his death. In John chapter 17, starting in verse 1, the apostle John recorded for us these words. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, and he's referring to the end of chapter 16, which Rashad finished up this last Sunday. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he said, Father, the hour has come. Now, on five different occasions in the Gospel of John, we are told that the hour has not yet come. Five different times, chapter 2, verse 4, chapter 7, verse 6, verse 8, verse 30, chapter 8, verse 20. Five different times, Jesus mentions the hour has not yet come. What Jesus has been saying over and over again throughout this gospel has been building up to the hour. The hour is going to come, and what hour that is is what we're going to have in view here in a minute. But there was a sense of there needs to be some explanation of what God's kingdom is like. The hour has, has not yet come. Earlier in Mark's gospel, chapter 1, it's recorded that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven, the way things were created to be, the way God operates without the inoculating dysfunction of sinners. Where things are as they truly should be most, the kingdom of heaven is now at hand, it's available, it's in your midst, it's around you, it's available for you. The way life should be can be found. He says, so repent and believe. Put your faith in, put your trust in, put your hope in this good news. This good news that God's reign and his rule, his interactive deliverance of people is now available. You can be set free. Jesus has been showing the disciples what it means to live fully in the kingdom and fully from the kingdom. God's love, God's mercy, his wisdom, and his power. Jesus has taught us in all of these gospels what heaven is really like and what heaven on earth looks like. Verse 6 of chapter 17, he goes on. Jesus in his prayer says, I have manifested, Father, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Jesus has taught what the Father's name carries in this life. And Rashad brought that to mind this last week. And my daughter Anna was the recipient of a sermon illustration where Rashad helpfully reminded us of what it means to operate in someone else's name and how we can operate in the name of Jesus the kingdom alive in our lives right now. But he goes on, he says, out of the world. This is what's key about this text tonight. In Matthew, I'm sorry, in John chapter 17, verse six, part A, the first part of the verse, he says, I've manifested your name. I've shown people what your name, what the who you are-ness looks like in the world. And I showed it to the people whom you gave me out of the world. And this is really important for us tonight. Out of the world the world. It wasn't like the disciples were a special camp of uh, of different breeds of humans. You know, they weren't a little bit taller. They didn't have a little bit more hair. Not that having more hair would be an advantage, but you can imagine. In this moment, he's just saying that there are people that he made known what God is like in the full, available for them to understand it, to some people who were, quote, out of the world. So how should we think and feel about this word, world? Romans chapter 1 
through chapter three. In Paul's letter to the church at Rome, verse 18 of chapter one through verse 20 of chapter three is an intentional clash on every culture that's ever lived, including ours right now. If you want to see what it is like to be both offended as a religious person or an irreligious person, read Romans 1, 18 through chapter three, verse 20. I promise you will be offended. Your feelings will get hurt, your toes may be bruised, and your ego will be slaughtered. And that is the prime place that Jesus intends for us to be found. For the wrath of God, chapter 1, verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. And this is powerful because what that means is, well, if it's revealed from heaven, to what is it revealed? The world, and he says it this way, he says, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. This revealed wrath is what we are here tonight to remember and to respond to. We have to understand the bad news if we can even begin to taste and embrace the good news. If we ignore that there is in fact bad news, then the good news will be no better than a cherry on some whipped topping on a dessert that will only make us chubbier than we were before and not prepared to run the race we've been asked to run. We must understand what bad news there is so that the good news might shine as bright as it can, as it intends to. So tonight, Romans chapter 3, I'm going to move through these texts pretty quickly, starting in verse 9. For we have all, this is our picture of the world. What's wrong with the world? Let's take a look. Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 9. For we have already charged that all, both the Jews and the Greeks, are under sin. What's wrong with the world? Sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. We all naturally run from him, not to him. If you question this, think of the last time you were truly ashamed of something you did. Was the very instant that you recognized it, the very instant you as well ran to your Father in heaven? Or did you wait a while to kind of clean yourself up? and to get further distanced from that sin and then kind of muster up some strength to slowly wander back into maybe a moment of apologetic prayer. Verse 12, all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And there it is, that phrase, all have turned aside. Church, there is a willfulness to our wandering. We like to drift. If you doubt that, take a look at what happens the next time you pick up your cell phone. We wander from anything that we center ourselves on, priority, good or bad, we drift. It says, all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Verse 13, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Church, sinful words are signs of our inner decay. When we are fraught with sinful language and constantly peppering it out, gossip and tearing down other people, it is evidence of a decay that is still rooted in us that must be seen first. Tonight, I want you to take those things and I want you to bring them out in front of you and I want you to be honest. Yep, they're here. Don't condemn yourself and don't ignore these things. See them, just see them. We will find what it is that is dealing with them and how we can trust they have in fact been dealt with altogether. Verse 13, I'm sorry, verse uh, uh, 15. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. We are terrible at healthy relationships. We are not active toward peace with one another, but passive and lazy at best. We are often forming ways to seek non-confrontation instead of rebuilding health. Finally, verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. There are perhaps many relationships and items in our lives tonight that we feel or believe we need or deserve to hang on to. But God neither sanctions those items or relationships, nor does he even tolerate them. And yet we permit them over and over So what do we do with this? What can we do? The answer, it's the wrong question. The right question is instead is what has been done? And the answer is everything. He goes on in verse 19 of chapter three. Now we know 
that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. And church, this is where your singing begins. Chapter three, verse 21, but now, and the temper in your heart should start to get a little better, and the wooziness over some of the failures of your past should start to get a little clearer, and a little excitement and a little hope should start to build right about now, because verse 21, though true, builds to 22, and 23 lays hope that no matter what pain and stain we have created or found, there is relief on the horizon, not even just, but within. Listen, Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And Rashad cleaned that up last week. The the right standing, the totally clean life, the reconciled totally to God permanently forever, untouchable hope and happiness and true resolve available completely by faith in Jesus Christ for those who believe. Not by those who do the certain good works or take care of these certain behaviors, but the the folks who just say, I'm taking that check and I'm gonna receive whatever it is he has for me. And I'm not gonna stand on my own attitude, my own behaviors, my own past. I'm I'm not gonna do any of those things. I'm gonna trust that Jesus Christ alone, his blood on my life is sufficient for me to be totally loved, totally held, totally kept, totally pure. And I'm gonna be fine. Is that what stokes in us? Verse 23. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned. What's wrong with the world? I am. All have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. And are justified, made right, cleaned up, by His grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What's wrong with the world? I am. But somebody else got in the way of where that was taking me. Jesus takes people out of the world, death, sin, decay, evil, wickedness, shame, guilt. It's a list. It's real. And it was mine. It was mine all day. Lies and manipulation, slander, all day. The only thoughts and intentions of all of our hearts were only evil continually. It's the narrative of what is wrong with the world. And yet, he takes people out of the world which is what we celebrate in John 17. He takes these people out of the world and makes them his own by faith alone. Verse nine of John 17, he goes on, I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but I am praying for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Present tense. He goes on, he says, I'm praying for them. The hours before Jesus is arrested and murdered, he is praying for his followers who were going to be given access to the forgiveness of their sins permanently and the power to heal their lives perfectly by the following and learning from Jesus in every area of those lives and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit forever. He goes on, he says, for they are yours. Church, God's will is to secure a family, a secure family healed whose sins are forgiven and who are restored in every way now and forever. The solutions that you and I seek for our every malady in our normal life will be found nowhere except in recognizing our deep need. Our deep need to be both cleansed of our sins and given power in our lives to turn from them in the first place. Do you want to stop sinning in the things that you wish were gone already? to become the loving, caring, compassionate, obedient people that resemble Jesus' love and his grace and his truth who are growing into him in every way. Jesus' prayer continues before we find his death 
in the subsequent chapters. Chapter 17, verse 12, he goes on, while I was with them, Father, I kept them in your name. And that needs to start to set something up for you. It doesn't say they worked really hard to stay kept. It doesn't say that they showed up to church every time they were told to and they didn't miss once because they knew if they missed once or they knew if they didn't do the right things or give enough in the giving box or if they didn't say the right prayers that they were going to be out. No, it says Jesus is praying to the Father and he says, I kept them in your name which you have given me. I have guarded them and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. He goes on later in his power, verse 20, he says, I do not ask for these only, but I also ask for those who will believe in me through their message. Verse 24, Father, church, lift your chin for a second. I've been with people as they take their last breath. Some of you have. I've also had the opportunity to sit with people as they know their time is nearing its end. And in those moments, you get a level of lucidity with people, a level of clarity that is incredible. They understand their priorities. They understand what is a win and what is a loss. And they, they're not emotionally losing their minds really in any way. They have such focus and clarity that it's awe-inspiring. Jesus, in this moment, knows. He just told us, the hour is coming. My time is about up. Jesus knows what's about to happen. He's walking headlong into it. He's not deterred by it. He's not excited. He's not like, I can't run fast enough. But he stops and he prays. And in this prayer, what does he pray for? You. He prays for you. He says, I'm not only praying for these believers who are with me now, you know, the ones who are sleeping, those guys. I'm not just praying for those guys. I'm also praying for everybody who will believe in me one day at Church at Main, 1500 East Main Street, Brownsburg, Indiana. I am praying right now for everyone in the future who is going to believe in me through their message. So what does Jesus pray? He prays for unity. But not only that, listen to verse 24. Father, remember, these are Jesus' last moments on earth. These are the moments where his clarity and his focus and his desires are all coming out. I don't know what you're thinking about if you get the grace of winding up on a deathbed perspective where you can share your final thoughts. That is a luxury afforded to few nonetheless. Jesus here records such things for us and I want you to listen to what he asks for. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am. You might want for your work week to go well next week. You might want for things to go well with Easter festivities among your family this weekend. Jesus' prayer at the end of his life, I just want him to come home. Father, I just want him home. Father, I pray that they are with me to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. This is what Jesus, our Lord, is praying in his last hour for you, for me. What Jesus is chasing in his prayer the night before he dies is he wants us home with him. Verse 26, he goes on, I made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Jesus intends, God wills that people turn to him, trust him, believe and be relieved from the world and all that is wrong with it. John chapter 19, verse 17. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic and Latin and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, 
They took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it and see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says they divided my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What's wrong with the world? What price, honestly, do we put on our mistakes, on our errors? What price do we really put on those things? What is the actual cost of our lifelong rebellion against our Creator? What redeems all of our self-guided losses? The price of my sin in my life is the price of God's only begotten Son. So the only honest response is to ignore him altogether or to receive this love and mercy as the free gift that it truly is. You either ignore this message altogether and go on with your life or you let it touch you in the heart that you have, the wounded place that you hold. And you remember that God's love came near, so near that it stood where we stand, breathed what we breathe and spilled blood where we frolic. This God came that near to love you and to redeem you and to hold you. So at this time, I want to invite you to make your way to the tables in the front and the back. And we're going to lock our sober minds in on focus to think of this Jesus this way. Tables in the front, tables in the back. Please return to your seat with the juice, the cup, and the bread we'll take together.
these next few minutes, I'm going to ask you to allow yourself to be way more honest than you might normally try to be in a gathering like this. Few of us take sufficient time to capture our wandering thoughts and make them behave for a minute. What I'm asking you to do is to not beat yourself up over sin, but I want you to be honest that it might be there. But then if you leave that there by itself and you ignore the cross, then you have a problem. But if instead you take that moment and you remember what we're doing together here with the bread and the cup, then you move past guilt and shame, fear or anxiety, and you celebrate with joyful hope that God's love is real, it is here, and it will not fail you. You will have a diagnosis you don't like, <clears throat> but you will never have a cross that Jesus didn't hang better on, spill better blood on. There's nothing in this life to fear. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, helping a church in Corinth get its feet right, says this about the Lord's Supper. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. You. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim Good Friday. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. A couple of recent posts on social media stated the following. Truth without love is harshness. It gives us information, but in such a way that we cannot really hear it, not to the heart. Truth without love is harshness. It gives us the information, but in such a way that we can't actually hear it. The other post stated this, love without truth is sentimentality. It supports and affirms us, but keeps us in denial about our true flaws. Fleming Rutledge wrote a book on the crucifixion and the, resur and the resurrection, and she writes this, the precious blood of the Son of God is the perfect sacrifice for sin. The ransom is paid to deliver the captives. The gates of hell are stormed. The Red Sea is crossed and the enemy is drowned. God's judgment has been executed upon sin. The disobedience of Adam is now recapitulated in the obedience of Jesus Christ. A new creation is coming into being. Those who put their trust in Christ are incorporated into his life. The kingdoms of the present evil age are passing away. And the promised kingdom of God is manifest, not in triumphalist crusades, but in the cruciform witness of the church. From within Adam's human flesh, the incarnate son fought with and was victorious over Satan on our behalf and in our place. So, in the death of Jesus Christ, the wrath of God toward all wickedness and sin is now satisfied. And those who place their trust in God's forgiveness for them are now justified freely by his grace. So church, 
Are you free? Are you free? Do you lay your sin on his life the way that he laid his life on your sin? This is the point where if we are cut to the heart, we can repent, we can be baptized, and we can receive his spirit all the way. Your experiences and your journey in this life are not louder than the cross of Jesus Christ. Do you know who you really are? Do you know that God loves you? Will you trust that God loves you?